What is up? Welcome to Culture FC, the weekly soccer show that's not really about soccer. We cover lifestyle, music, fashion, politics, all the things surrounding the beautiful game, just none of the stuff happening on the actual pitch. My name is Louie. I'm Brendan. And in this week's episode, we covered quite a few different topics. To start it off, we talked about the Europa League final between Chelsea and Arsenal being played in Azerbaijan. And on top of that, we talked about how for the first time in history, four clubs from the same country will be disputing the European Cups with all four English teams making the finals for the Champions League and the Europa League. And lastly, our biggest story of the week, we talked about Alex Morgan being the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. We dove deep into why it's so much more than just pretty women in a swimsuit magazine and what it could mean for the United States Women's National Team and, and women's soccer in general. If you enjoy this episode, make sure you subscribe to our podcast. You can find us on all of the different podcasting apps and consider leaving us a review. We would we love honesty and we want to get better at what we do. So your feedback is very much needed. If you can't get enough of us, you can follow us on all of our socials at Trouble Soccer. That is T-R-E-B-L soccer on all of the different social media platforms. You can follow us on YouTube where we have a weekly MLS show as well as where we post the video version of this podcast. But that's enough of my rambling. Let's get into this week's episode. All right. Well, first off, I'd like to start off this episode by uh, apologizing to everyone because of how much I spoke about Ajax and Barcelona last week <laughs> and how them going to the final was going to be amazing and basically writing off Tottenham and Liverpool. Um, but quite frankly, I'm glad I was wrong because these past two games, those two results were just insane and everything that is right and great about football. Literally anything can happen and change until that final whistle blows. So you know what? Yeah, maybe those two games broke the hearts of Ajax and Barca fans, but it was a huge win for soccer, so I'm glad that I was wrong. As am I. (laughs) But either way, you're right. It was an absolute... There's no other way you would want a tournament like this to go. Really excited for June 1st. I know we don't talk scores, if that, but you know, it's a really special occasion, especially with how it's gone down. I, myself, am kind of bummed out that Ajax didn't make it through. Yeah. Um... I think it's it would be more of an exciting team to play rather than play rather Tottenham. than play Tottenham. But you never know. Tottenham's known to do some crazy things <laughs> sometimes. So like how they got here, right. you know, <laughs> they got here for a reason too. So that's we'll also see. true. Um, but on that note, the fact that the teams that did advance Tottenham and Liverpool are both English is very interesting. And the reason it's interesting is because the two finalists of the Europa League are also both English. Chelsea and Arsenal are going to be facing off in the Europa League final just a couple of days before Liverpool and Spurs do in Madrid. And so that means that for the first time in all of history, that the four European Cup finalists will come from the same country. Like that's never happened before. That's bonkers. And if if it doesn't feel, it feels weird because of like how the, just the Premier League has kind of played out this season. You know, yeah. like both Chelsea and Arsenal have had some varts, uh volatile moments throughout yep. the season yep. and just to see them both in a, a cup final like that um is is weird to me it's been a very roller coaster premier league season you had man city who m- like rammed their way through the title yesterday like with the most points craziness pretty much like insane amount of, of action and, and and drama in the premier league yet they don't find themselves anywhere near european cup final yeah yet you know Liverpool, Tottenham, Chelsea, and Arsenal do. And then you had Man United, who deceived a lot of people. They beat PSG. And then, like, you know, everyone started to think, oh, my God, like, there's so many English teams. And, of course, Man United shit the bet against Barca. Shit happens, you know. It almost, like, just shows so much about English soccer in general. The fact that these four clubs are now going to be competing for European Cups, like, like that's really cool. And it indicates just how strong the, the Premier League is. I mean, if you look at the Premier League from top to bottom, the Top six teams are all very, very good. Yeah. And not to mention the two teams that play seventh and eighth in the Prem were phenomenal as well. You had Watford and Wolves, who were who were both excellent all season long. And mind you, Wolves have beaten all four of these finalists that Yeah. In it, some it, way or form. Like they beat Liverpool in the FA Cup, they beat Manchester City. Um, they beat Tottenham, they beat Chelsea, they beat Arsenal. Like the Wolves have taken so many points from those other top 
eight sides, but it's just like, it's just incredible to think about how strong uh, the Prem is as a league. Uh, I think the last time anything like this even came close to happening was a couple of years back when you had Atletico Madrid playing Real Madrid in the final of the Champions League and Sevilla playing in the Europa League final, but they weren't playing a Spanish team. So it's crazy to see that this is actually happening. If this is also news because this will be the first Champions League final in the 21st century not to feature a team that had won a league title in the 21st century. So neither Tottenham nor Liverpool have won a ah. league title in this century, yet both of them are going to be playing for the Champions League final. How crazy is that? That is crazy. <laughs> but as for the Europa League, Chelsea face Arsenal in Baku in Azerbaijan, a country that is pretty much barely Europe. It is almost in the Middle East. And like, I guess technically parts of Azerbaijan are part of Europe. Um, but Baku is 2,500 miles away from London. Hmm. That is very, very far. And on top of that, despite the stadium fitting 68,700 spectators, each club is only being given 6,000 tickets for their fans. So this this whole ticket allocation thing isn't something that's really new. And we've talked... What's interesting about this is that in a final where potentially if Arsenal win it, they, it'll be the first European title they've ever won. Mm -hmm. They won't be able to bring that many of their supporters. Even though the stadium fits about 70,000 people, only 12,000 of those seats are going to the fans of each club. Which is ridiculous yeah that doesn't seem like it would even make a very good atmosphere for players to play in absolutely not and this isn't really new it's happening it, it happens in the champions league every year and it happens in the europa league every year but when you really look at it and think like the fact that uefa needs those extra fifty-six thousand seven hundred seats for corporate sponsors politicians and other random people that they need to schmooze rather than giving it to the fans it's just jarring you know what i mean yeah because i'm thinking about it this way right you're Let's say you're a diehard Arsenal supporter. You go to every away game. You fly to everywhere they go whenever they play in Europe. And then all of a sudden, Arsenal make the final. And you're like, great, this is amazing. I'm finally going to get to experience Arsenal in a European final. And then they go, oh, the final's in Azerbaijan. Yeah. Almost 3,000 miles away. Plus, there's only 6,000 seats for Arsenal supporters. Plus, getting there is probably not going to be cheap. And you're going to have to fly, I don't know, 20 something hours. They'll like get the, 6,000 easy though. I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. But, but think just about like, it, though, the, like you should be like in a stadium that fits 70,000. Why not give each set of fans like 12,000 tickets? Yeah. You really need to give that many tickets and seats to like sponsors and other people. Yeah. Well, like what happens to the other tickets? They basically go to politicians, sponsors, anybody that they need to schmooze or like give a ticket to like, they're not it's very, very strange. I don't huh. even know how many of them are general admission because I don't think there are many general admission tickets either, like not for each set of yeah. fans, but for regular fans. So it it must create a very weird atmosphere for a final. Yeah, I mean, I was looking at pictures and it, it, it's a huge stadium. Why, it is. why wouldn't you want to give those tickets up? Weird. You know, it's one of those things where it's like the money means more. Because when you look at this, you know, why wasn't the Europa League final in, in somewhere closer to mainland Europe? Why was it so far away in Azerbaijan? And you start thinking about like, what is UEFA trying to gain from this? So clearly they're trying to do something political here by having it there. And, and it's just like, it's that part about soccer that sucks. It's that money aspect where it's like people are going to suffer or miss out just because UEFA wants to make extra money and schmooze with people in Azerbaijan and like tighten political ties. Like... They act like a country rather than a sports competition. Yeah, you know which I mean? is which really is is something that shouldn't happen. But I feel like does across the board in most things. I will be way more in tune with how the audience and the crowd looks when I am watching that Europa League final. Absolutely. Now, <laughs> now I'm, I'm going to be thinking about like, yeah. man, how is that atmosphere playing out? Is it boring? Is it you know loud? And you, is it silent? Then I wonder. Do you know how many tickets are allotted for the Champions League final? Similar. It, similar. Liverpool and Tottenham are experiencing very similar problems because it's the same kind of thing. It's 6,000 tickets for each set of fans. And the Wanda Metropolitano fits like seven or 60,000 people. So actually, I think the Wanda Metropolitano is smaller than Baku Stadium. Yeah. But they're still, I guess by percentage wise, Liverpool and Tottenham are getting more than Arsenal and Chelsea. But either way, it's not exactly great. <laughs> but what's funny is that UEFA didn't pick 
Baku as the Europa League final location for convenience for football. Azerbaijan is a country with new riches from oil money, and Azerbaijan was really keen on hosting the event because it's part of their campaign to kind of promote themselves as part of Europe rather than as part of the Middle East. And so they've actually hosted a couple of other things like the European Games, a Formula One race specifically entitled the European Grand Prix, and a Eurovision Song Contest. And next year, they're going to host matches for Euro 2020. So it's just very weird that it's like becoming this political tool for a country. Um, but worse than that, worse than the, the the problem of the ticket allocations is what's going on with Henrik Mkhitaryan with Arsenal. So Henrik Mkhitaryan is Armenian oh. and he has played 11 of Arsenal's Europa League games this season. But because Azerbaijan and Armenia don't have diplomatic relations because of a war that they fought uh, in, in back in the 80s and 90s, they wouldn't allow Mkhitaryan a visa potentially and it was an issue a couple years back when he didn't travel to Baku with Borussia Dortmund facing one of the clubs from Azerbaijan and also he didn't travel with Arsenal earlier this year to go to Karabag which is also in Azerbaijan for the same reasons so that's so ridiculous to me that like yeah hey one of your better players who's partaken in majority of the games most likely won't be able to play in this final. Do you think it was already the deal was already struck so far in advance that they didn't know? It, it's or hard I guess it's it's hard because you don't expect Arsenal to make it to the final because that that's where <laughs> the, I mean not, you know like you know or like you don't know if they're gonna make it right. So therefore, and, and it's one of those things where they probably could have avoided it by just picking a part of Europe that doesn't have <laughs> issues like that. Yeah, I'm here sitting here defending like, oh, you know, maybe they already picked a stadium. It's like, why don't you could pick a number of stadiums? Of course, I think they did say that UEFA is trying to work out something with other Azerbaijan to allow Mkhitaryan to travel. But that's just it's another problem on top of this pile of problems. Yeah, that could have been avoided had UEFA just picked a better location for this final. I get it. You didn't know that any of the finalists would be so from so far away. But at the same time, you weren't expecting any Middle Eastern teams to make it to the final or any teams from that area of Europe to make it to the final. So it doesn't really make much sense to host it there. Yeah, it really doesn't. And that just is almost it. It makes me feel like that is a country that is acting like someone who just fell into money and it's like, ooh, I want to see race cars and soccer <laughs> matches and I want to be surrounded by all my favorite things. It, I, can't, I guess if we're if I'm going to play like devil's advocate here, it, I, it is a good tactic to try and get ingrained into Europe and to try and get people to connect Azerbaijan with Europe. But it's just, it's such a clear and blatant money grab by UEFA that it's, it, it's going to be weird. Like, I can't imagine the traveling supporters for either club, like, going to Azerbaijan and, like, really enjoying it based on all the things that they're going to have to deal with, you know? Yeah, and I guess here's a question for you. I mean, we would we, we found out about this, but do you think, other than the traveling fans and maybe, like, a core supporter group of Arsenal fans, do you think a lot of these people know about most likely because it, but like I said, this isn't something new. This happens often. You know what I mean? Oh, UEFA that's picks true. locations that usually piss off a lot of people. Um, and so I think it's pretty, pretty much everyone knows. It is funny that they keep the Champions League final usually in places that are, I guess they did put it in Kiev yeah. last year. So they do try to rotate it around, but the, it seems like the Champions League final usually stays in more traditional yeah. places, I guess. But, um, it's interesting, man. I, yeah. I do want to actually get Egg and Mikey's opinion. So I'm going to send them a voice memo and hope that they answer so I can include this into the podcast. Oh, 21st century boy. Yeah, look at that. Hey, fellas. So uh, B and I are recording a podcast here right now, and we were talking about how uh, the Europa League final is going to be played in Azerbaijan and how basically it's a giant clusterfuck. So I was hoping you guys could send me a voice memo back with just some of your thoughts about your clubs and their supporters having to travel to fucking Azerbaijan to watch a final. Thanks in advance. I'm going to toss it into the episode. Um, so yeah, go off, rant a little bit. I want to get each of you guys' opinions. Much appreciated. Love you both. Thanks. It's honestly a clusterfuck. Chelsea fans have, from what I've read... It's been hell even trying to get a ticket to the final. And on top of that, even if you do get a ticket to the final, the location itself where in Azerbaijan isn't isn't ready to host this big of an event. You know what I mean? Like, apparently hotels, just, just anywhere, finding places to stay in general has been hell to locate. 
So they honestly chose an awful location for this, for this for this game. And only that, I don't know if you have seen pictures of the stadium. It's an awful stadium. There's an entire Olympic track around it. You're so far. The fans are so far from the field. The Chelsea and Arsenal supporters are side by side, section wise, behind one of the goals, and the rest of the the rest of the arena, stadium, whatever it is, is just. I honestly have no words for it. The way they've handed out tickets, the way they've gone about doing this and setting up this final, it's embarrassing. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know who's in charge of this, but it's a shit show, flat out. It's really, really been a mess, to be honest, for the whole Europa League final, um, especially since it's where it's located, um, basically on the border of Asia, kind of, um, in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Not, It's kind of hard to travel there. I've been reading about that stuff as well. It's hard to travel there. A um, bunch of flights you'll have to take. And yeah, we also have that whole issue with Mickey not being able to travel with us because of the whole um, conflict with Armenia as well. And it's kind of ridiculous that UEFA would al allow a venue for a final that has such conflict with other European countries or country that wouldn't allow a player, even if it's just one player to play, why would they make the final so inaccessible for that player? It's, it's truly ridiculous. Like Eggy said, the Chelsea and Arsenal supporters are literally side by side. And who knows if the game takes like an ugly turn, it could get ugly right in that section, right between them. And you're telling me that, um, you're only, you're only allocating a certain amount of tickets for fans. They're giving more tickets to sponsors than they are to Arsenal fans and Chelsea fans who are traveling to support their club in this final. FIFA has been asked with the World Cup in Qatar and now UEFA is stepping up to their level with this whole Baku thing. <laughs> I was about to say thanks into the mic. Like, <laughs> like they, uh, oh my God. But then about your question of Tottenham and Liverpool and how if they're experiencing any issues, uh, they are actually having trouble with flights. Uh, someone was reporting about how some airlines are charging around 1,300 British pounds per ticket with people accusing them of like trying to profiteer off of this date. To give you an idea, air travel in Europe really isn't that expensive between countries. No. You, know, you could probably fly between like Madrid and, and London usually for maybe 80 euro, potentially, maybe a little bit less. But the fact that they're charging about 1,300 pounds is, is absurd. Like, that's such bullshit. Like, and the wild thing is, is just the fact that the companies are probably price gouging and totally absolutely. profiteering, which is absolutely. just like... It's like we. It's the reason why we can't have nice things. You know yeah. what I mean? Like someone clearly likes soccer. The cut. The, the world clearly loves football. People are excited about a final. Well, let's hike up the price for everything. Yeah. Good luck getting here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's that counterintuitive thing where it's like yes, a bunch of people love football and they want to go to the game and they want to experience it. And so of course that means that there's a higher demand for things, so you can raise the price of things. But unfortunately the more you raise the price of stuff the less people start to follow that thing anymore because they can't afford to do it it's that same problem that we've been facing in the 21st century with soccer it's as prices rise people start to fall out of love with the sport to an extent yep. and because it's becoming so commercialized and it's like man i just wish that for the final which should be more about the celebration of a beautiful season that it should be about the sport and not about the money i would rather them gouge people with prices on every other match day but leave the final alone. Yeah, like even if they hiked up like the prices across the board during like the knockout stages. Like, like I'm sure no one want to hear that. But. No, but if it to allow for like the final to be almost like a traditional kind of thing, you know, like something that is is that happens the same time, the same way every year and it's kept neutral and it's kept low so that everyone can enjoy. Yeah, because, you know, it should be about the celebration of that season, not about, and, and to crown a champion, and not about how much money can we take from people, you know? But all right, moving along to our next little news topic of this week. Over this past weekend, Juventus have released their new home jersey for the 19 and 20 season. So you might be thinking, why is that big news? Well, uh, the reason it's big news is that 
this is the first time in over the 100 years of their existence that Juventus will be playing without black and white stripes on their home kit. Did you get a look at, at the Yeah, the they kit? played in it, right? They played in it over the weekend, yeah. Yeah. Um, Where it was like black, gray, and like a pink stripe right down the middle. Yeah, it, it, I don't like it. I don't it, like it, it from a style point. E- like, even if I... It, let's pretend that I didn't know Juve had black and white stripes as their iconic look. Yeah. If I looked at this jersey, I would not like it. No, neither would I. But just the fact that they've totally kind of stamped out, like, their tradition is kind of... I get where... I get it, but it's just... It was too much, and it's it's not what you should do. You can't fuck with that. Right. And it's kind of like... It's very similar to when they replaced their crest... But overall, in the in the end, people kind of like now look at the crest and go, you know what? Like it's pretty decent. It kind of has the shape of a crest. It's modern. It's it's like this new step in football design, I guess. But where I think it's going to be different with this jersey is that clubs have the same home jersey, pretty much the same for their entire existence. Like yeah, you can look up photos from like the 1950s and 1940s, and you'll see that Real Madrid were playing in an all white home shirt back then. You know what I'm yep. saying? And if you pull up pictures from like 80 years ago, AC Milan still wore black and red stripes. Like that is something that doesn't change. Like clubs have the same tradition for their home kit pretty much like year over year. And that's what makes these clubs iconic. Whereas with crests, you're always updating them because you're updating fonts and trying to make it more modern. But you should always have something rooted in, in some kind of base, in my opinion. And so, you know, they're known as like the zebra in Italy and like they play in black and white and like... Now it's they completely threw that out for something that is just weird. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a traditionalist when it comes to to no, because like, I'd be like, there with you. I I'm right there with you. I think it just it it just feels like a younger generation is trying to like mess around with the zebra. It would almost be as if like Barcelona just decided one day, you know what, guys, our home kit's now going to be green and we're going to have one big white star in the middle. Yeah. It would make no sense. And no. then people would just be like, what the hell? Like what? For style decisions? Um, I just, I guess I really just don't understand the pink. You know, I get the black and the white side, you know, that that's in like the alternating stripes. It's almost like it's a stripe, but not really because it's yeah. just like half of the shirt. Yeah. And the sleeves are alternating. Like, it's it's kind of... A, it could have done it better, is what I'm trying... I guess yeah. I'm trying to say. And But I think you make a good point. The pink really just doesn't make sense. It's just kind of there. Yeah. It really... It, it, they could have... I think they could have done a different... I feel like any color would have been better, Or just almost. no color there. What if it was just black and white? Yeah. If it was just black and white, I would say, like, that's a different you know take what? on... It would be like, hey, that's a totally different take on the so stripes. I think, I think we've narrowed it down. The pink really is the problem here. <laughs> Yes, because if the pink wasn't there, I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> now that you look at it, like each sleeve is a different color. Each of the three stripes is a, uh, either black or white on either side. Yeah. And then it's just the fucking pink, dude. Yeah. Dumb. It almost looks like without that pink, you would almost be able to like think, okay, they just zoomed in really far. On TV yeah. And there are the stripes. <laughs> but with the pink, it's unmistakable. You're just like, all right, great. Nope. They definitely chose that. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, we have away jerseys to play with. Like, Juve usually has really dope away kits. Like, they're really nice. Mess with your away kit. Don't yeah. mess with the home one. <laughs> yeah, especially a home one that is just so well known. You are you are known world over for being that. You Can know, you and... Just change it? And I feel like, honestly, around... Like, when you're seeing someone walking in a street and you see those black and white stripes... I almost 90% of the time, without looking at any of the crests, think it's Juve. Absolutely. It be, it's iconic of them. But not anymore. Uh, but either way, what do you guys think? Are, am I, are we being harsh? Do you think that football does need to modernize its design? Or do you think that home kits should pretty much stay the same year in and year out? But alrighty, guys. Moving along to our main topic of this week. Alex Morgan is the cover of the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Issue. So, we all know the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue. It's the one issue a year anybody actually cares about because usually it's some very attractive females in skimpy bikinis posing, sometimes naked, half-naked, painted. You know, it's a great issue to pay attention to as most people do pay attention. I'll be honest with you, I don't care about Sports Illustrated at any other point of the year other than when this swimsuit edition comes out. I know that may sound horrible, but I think that that's when it generates the most buzz. Yeah, I'll agree, and I think 
Most of the Sports Illustrated issues I've other s- ever seen that weren't in like a dentist office <laughs> were 100% probably the swimsuit edition. So while this isn't the first time that Alex Morgan has graced the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition, this time it's a very big deal. Uh, she is on one of the main covers, but isn't alone in posing for the magazine, as a few of her U- United States Women's National Team teammates joined her this time to model, uh, including the first time an openly gay female has been actually featured in the uh, Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition ever. Uh, Megan Rapino. Uh, co-captain of the United States Women's National Team, also posed for the magazine. And in addition to Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino, Crystal Dunn and Abby Dahlkemper also appear in this uh, swimsuit edition. So why is it important for soccer to talk about this? Well, for one, the United States Women's National Team has recently filed a lawsuit against the United States Soccer Federation, and the timing of this magazine could not have been more perfect. It's coming out at the beginning of you know our summer season, and with the Women's World Cup starting in less than a month, it was just perfect. Uh, especially because the lawsuit has been fresh in everybody's minds and they're still fighting it. And so by them coming up and being a part of this magazine, it just puts more national limelight on them and their fight. Yeah, it really, it allows people to not only see them in a more, in a different light as opposed to just seeing them as soccer players, but then it, it's not just an issue about pictures. There's stories too. Yep. So that that's highlighting the fact that what's going on and that that's big to get that on paper and to get that, that's going to be solidified. Like, you know, that's there. And especially because Sports Illustrated is something that weirdly enough, I, I think that a majority of the American media does pay attention when it comes to the swimsuit issue. Like I said earlier, when it comes to the to women's soccer in this in the states, people really only care around the World Cup. Some in terms of national media attention, it's not always that they get national media attention. I actually find it to be so clever that these women went and did the swimsuit ed- edition because that puts so many eyeballs on what they're doing and it forces their way into the national conversation. The swimsuit edition is a massive thing that comes out every year, and so for these women to be a part of it just draws so much attention to them that they otherwise would not have uh especially when it comes to this lawsuit where it the public opinion does matter and so to your point but despite the fact that you know a lot of people just look at it for the pictures of the pretty women there are actual articles being written by sports illustrated that accompany each of these shoots and they have videos and they talk about what each person uh finds important and and one of in one of these articles, uh, they said that what is happening is that year after year, the United States Soccer Federation continues to allocate fewer resources towards women's soccer than to the men. For, from salaries to marketing and promotion to adequate training and playing conditions, the lawsuit asserts that the women are getting the short end of the stick, all while they continue to dominate their sport. It's an issue that's all too common in the workplace, not just on the soccer field, and it's driving the members of the United States Women's National Team to speak up on behalf of female athletes and women everywhere. It really is empowering women through something that usually almost objectifies women to an extent because some people might think oh my god i can't believe they they take a sports magazine and objectify women but when you look at it men are allowed to basically pose in underwear and half naked all the time and no one bats an eye they just think oh great cristiano ronaldo he's selling perfume david beckham he can make it and sell cologne like it's cool but then when a woman does something like that it all becomes this issue of like oh my god i can't believe this athlete or this woman's like half naked on a yeah and you're like Fuck off. They're athletes too. They want to show off their toned bodies. Think about how many times people drool when they see Cristiano Ronaldo half naked. Fuck, I even get a little <laughs> mouthwatery when I see him like that. He's got like APAC abs. And so I think it's it's just about equality. What makes this whole conversation even more interesting is the inclusion of Megan Rapino in this group of four women in for the U.S. Women's National Team in the swimsuit edition. Because as being the first openly gay female to ever feature in this magazine, she talks about this exact issue we just mentioned. And she said, there's an, there's this assumption that everyone is posing for men, which I'm very much not. And I think that probably the majority of women aren't, Rapino says. It's okay to be sexy. It's okay to wear a swimsuit. It's okay to want to do that. It's about like, if it's okay for the men to do that, why can't women do that and feel empowered through their bodies? Yeah, it... it, it really does just it makes a case for any person who has some kind of notoriety whether it be athlete celebrity as soon as it's a woman wanting to just be beautiful 
you know, and just like not to not for and for nothing, nothing other than not just to being, sexualize it or objectify it, but just to look at it and be like, yes, yeah, you have a beautiful. It's body, like, yo, right? I, I want to wear that shit. That looks good. I will, you know what? Fuck that. I want someone to take pictures of me in this shit, you know. And like, I think it's just wild that um, there's just this preferred treatment of men. It's like a giant stigma. Um, yeah, it's like as soon as a woman comes and poses, she's next step is playboy (laughs) and what's interesting is that most years with the swimsuit edition they don't ever really get athletes they usually just get the best looking models that they can get you know like kate upton is a model she's been on the swimsuit edition cover before i i think the other covers this year are camille kostek which is rob gronkowski's girlfriend and um tyra banks actually is the other cover uh, that they have and so usually it's not an athlete so what i think is very interesting is that I love the fact that they pulled actual athletes for the sports illustrated swimsuit edition yes. when normally they just pull models. It's like, yeah, get the pretty ones and then get the pretty ones and we'll take pictures of them. But yeah. no, this year it's like, get the athletes who are also the pretty ones and we'll take pictures of them. And not only that, we will help their story. Get- and empower women through their stories. It's so much more than just staring at pretty women in bikinis. Like the images of Alex Morgan and her teammates in bathing suits showing off their toned bodies is... In reality, just another fight for equality. Uh, it's it's setting an equal playing field by allowing females to show off their bodies to the public eye, just as the men do. It's what this whole thing is about, and it's about being okay to be a woman, and they deserve just as much as the men. Um, like, yes, the women are pretty, and they are toned, and but they have a message, and it's they have something that they're fighting for, and by doing this, it, all it does is just shine a bigger light on this. B, my question to you is, overall, what do you think the impact of the swimsuit edition is going to be? Do you think it's just going to be what it usually is? A bunch of men picking up this magazine, looking at the pictures of the pretty women, and that was it? Or do you think this could possibly do more? No, I think it's definitely going to do more. Whether it be positive or negative, it's definitely going to cause um, a bit more of a stir than a normal Sports Illustrated issue would go with, I think. I think it's perfect timing in terms of the World Cup, what's going on. And I mean, the, I mean, the marketing team of Sports Illustrated really hit it on the head with this one, I think, in terms of making it an issue that is more than just your typical swimsuit issue. And I think it allows these women who are oftentimes, uh, unfortunately labeled as like these brolic women who play sports and that's what they do. When in reality, like, look at some of these women, you know? It's, They're it's all just, people. It doesn't matter if, like, just because they play sports, they can't be pretty or what it is. You precisely. Know, you can be whoever you want to be and just be a human being. You don't have to be labeled, you know? It's like, teenage girls and, like, girls in college are going to see that, too. And they may be playing sports and may be self-conscious with the fact that they're battling with loving their sport and maybe being forced to act a certain way or look a certain way you know and but in reality it's like look at these women who had the the peak shape peak performance everything and they can still and still want to do that so i think that's kind of cool and again the the timing is so perfect because with the world cup kicking off in just three weeks from the day that we're recording this i believe uh in june 9th in france it it's really hopefully going to bring not only the the United States women's national team to the forefront of the national media, but also their fight in, to the forefront of the national media. And hopefully this will just help overall the, the, the attention that people give to women's soccer. Uh, and not just because they're prettier than the men who play, but because they're real athletes. And the fact that the, these this magazine was showcasing real athletes and their bodies and showing that, hey, they're not just pretty, they have a story, they have things that are going on. I think that's very important, especially because as we've seen and we've talked about on this podcast over the last several episodes, a lot of things have been going right for women's soccer around the world lately. They've been able to sell out stadiums. They've been able to really garner a lot of attention. So this is just another one of those layers that are being added on to hopefully help propel women's soccer into where I think it should be. It should be right up there with men's soccer in terms of attendance, support, all of that. Because there's no advantage of being a man over a woman in soccer. A woman can run just as fast as a man. She could head a ball just as well as a man. She can kick a ball just as well as a man. It's about practice and about your determination. And so really, we just need to accept that because it's such a beautiful sport that it can be enjoyed from the men's side and the women's side. We just have to choose to support it. And overall, I just think her and her teammates participating in the swimsuit edition, all it does is help further their cause. 
Um, I think that, you know, it steps way past the idea of just objectifying these women and like, why would they subject themselves to just doing that? Well, the reason they're doing it is to is that it's all about equality from every standpoint. And so I think that that's a very powerful message for anybody who picks up this magazine or anybody who even sees this or hears about it, you know? Um, but overall, it can only be good for women's sport. Amen to that, dude. <laughs> um, what do you guys think? Is Sports Illustrated objectifying Alex Morgan and her teammates or is it empowering their cause and their fight for equality? Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And we'll be back next week.